Good morning, everyone. Uh, we give glory to God for giving us another opportunity to meet this morning. We just want to praise his name for all of us, for all the aunts that are involved in this work, and for all the ears that are open to listen to him, and more so for all the hearts that have been prepared to accept and receive the word of God. Let us pray. Our heavenly and everlasting Father, mortal human beings saved by grace, we have nothing to tell thy people. And Lord, now we just want to present ourselves as mouthpieces, that you may give nothing but your word to the glory of your name. Lord, may you draw us into your presence, that you may hear your voice say, this is a way walk ye in it, for we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. In my short experience, I think this is the most profound verse that exists in the Bible. Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. My version says, And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. In a previous study, we said that John was actually paraphrasing this verse when he said in the book of John chapter 3 verse 16 that for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. So in my estimation and truthfully so, John was actually elaborating what God meant in Genesis chapter 3 verse 15. Paul makes it even better in Galatians. I think it's chapter 3, verse 16 also. Maybe. Not so sure, but I think so. We can just confirm. Galatians chapter 3, 16. Uh, Galatians 3, 16. Yeah. And to thy seed, which is Christ. So Christ is the seed. We saw that very well. And when Christ arrived, we read some of part of his statement in the book of Luke 19, verse 10. For the Son of Man came to seek and save that which was lost. I have told you before, all, more than half of my life I've uh, spent teaching. And I have a little of teaching in me. I'm going to start with a question today. For those of us who were here during our first meeting, what did we lose? A number of things. Let's list them. Just help? Just help? Perfect. That's the word I'm looking for. Perfect help. Number two? Yeah. Perfect robe of righteousness. Number three? Perfect character. Number four? Face to face communion with whom? With God. Number five? A perfect home. Number six? immortality eternal life and number seven complete number we were lost ourselves when jesus was making that statement he was in zacchaeus house a lost brother and so when jesus says i came to seek that which seek and save that which was lost it means by his death by his ministry all these have been restored but the main the most important part had to do with the purpose that God had in mind. So today we'll start with the book of education, page 15, paragraph 2, and it says to restore in man the image of his maker, to bring him back to the perfection in which he was created, to promote the development of body, mind, and soul, that the divine purpose in his creation might be realized. This was to be the work of redemption. This is the object of education, the great object of life. And you ask yourself, what does our topic today, the blueprint, have to do with this? The point is, God wants to restore man to his original plan. 
And he has done that by the gift of his son, Jesus Christ. And here we say that his divine purpose would only be fulfilled once his image is remade, if that English is acceptable, in man. Restoring the image of man in his maker is the divine purpose of God. In different words, we have read this before. It says in this Salve Ages, page 161, For eternal ages it was God's purpose that every created being, from the bright and holy seraphs to man, should be a temple for the indwelling of the creator. Because of sin, humanity ceased to be a temple for God, darkened and defiled by evil, the heart of man no longer revealed the glory of the divine one. But by the incarnation of the Son of God, the purpose of heaven is fulfilled. God dwells in humanity, and through saving grace, the heart of man becomes again the temple of God. And so that is the purpose of God. And we learned yesterday that that's the reason we were created. Every other thing is secondary, maybe tertiary. But the main reason why I exist is to give God glory. And what did we learn giving God glory actually means? Answer me. Expressing the character of God. Sister White says, I think it's Christ Object Lesson 74, paragraph 4. She says, profession is nothing, nothing in the scale. It is character that decides destiny. And so we can know all that we want to know. We can study everything that we want to study. If that knowledge that not, does not develop the image of Christ in us, it is just a failure. And so she also says that character building, therefore, is the greatest work ever entrusted to man. And we saw yesterday that God has made it possible. We are the temple of the Lord. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 16. 1 Corinthians 3 verse 16. It is on this basis that Paul says, Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? 17. If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God do what? Destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. And so what the prophet says is actually a biblical principle. We are the temple of God. He himself has made it so. Come with me to chapter 6, the same book. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 19. 6, 19. It says what? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? It's a rhetoric question. Having known now that God created us, that we may reflect his image, don't you know you are the temple of the Lord? Verse 20. For ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are whose? God's. And I know for those of us who have come for a come meeting this year, we now know when the Bible says glorify God, we can make it practical because it makes sense to us. It's not raising hands and waving in the air. And singing at the top of our voices, glorifying God actually means reflecting his character to the people around us. And so he says we are God's temple and it intends that we glorify his name in all our interactions. In verse 16 of 2 Corinthians, chapter 6, Paul makes this following statement. First Corinthians, I mean 2 Corinthians chapter 6 verse 16. And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God, as God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. So God declares you and I his temple. Do you think God doesn't know that we are fallen? Do you think he has forgotten that we actually sinned in Eden? Has he forgotten that we are human beings that are prone to fall, to do sin, than to follow his way? I am I'm so sure he knows that very well, but still he declares you a temple of his Holy Spirit. In fact, it is for this reason that Matthew chapter 1 verse 21 says, Jesus would come. The virgin will have a child. 
His name will be Jesus because he will save his people in their sins. Oh, man, thank you very much. He will save his people from their sin. And because he has made that possible, he can now authoritatively tell us, come on, be my temple. Because I have already done what ought to be done for you to be saved from your sins, not in your sins. And that's going to be a very important aspect. In fact, in verse 23, it says, his name shall be Emmanuel. And what does that mean? God with us. Now, I want you to start thinking seriously. God with us. In other words, the plan of saving man from sin as an aspect, a very important aspect of God with us. God had to be amongst us for our salvation to be complete. He could have done it from heaven. Maybe he could have pressed some buttons and Adam would have changed his mind and be become saved. But that wouldn't have made it. He had to come and live amongst us for us to be saved. And so the whole heavens came down to this earth for you and I to be saved. Before the fulfillment of this promise, we see in the book of Exodus chapter 25, verse 8, God says, let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell amongst them. So the sanctuary was actually a miniature study of what Jesus wants to do to the human race. The only way we would be saved is if God dwells amongst us. This begs a big question. How was God to bring men, a fallen man, a sinful man, to become his temple? In what means, Heavenly Father, do you intend to make this possible? Why do you speak with a lot of confidence that we can actually reflect your image with this fallen flesh? Why is God so confident that he can bring us from that fallen nature and bring us to the point that people look at us, people listen to us, and they see Christ and hear Christ? And then he gives us an answer in chapter 77 of Psalm. The 77th Psalm. Verse 13, he tells us, Thy way, O God, is in the sanctuary. It's like, if you want to know how I can give you victory over all these sins that easily entangle you, go back to my sanctuary. If you really want to know what I can do for your life, head back to the sanctuary. Let me just do something here. Sorry. Thank you. So, the Lord calls upon us to go to the sanctuary to study how it is to make this a reality in your life and in my life. Now, I want to give you a summary, a one-minute summary of what the sanctuary is. The sanctuary was made of three major parts. We know them. We had the outer court, and then there was the holy place, and there's also the most holy place. There were things that God had within the sanctuary, articles of the sanctuary. But there were also ceremonies or sacrifices that were done in the sanctuary that meant a lot. And so we are going to take heed of God's advice or God's call to go back to the sanctuary to study how he's going to make it possible for George to reflect his image in spite of his weaknesses and the fact that he's a fallen human being. How is this going to happen? At this particular point, I want us to pick just one point about the sanctuary. We had the Shekinah glory in the most holy place. That means that was the dwelling place, the throne room of God. God lives in the sanctuary. Now, back to the story of creation. In the language of the sanctuary, we are fair to say that Adam and Eve, before the fall, were in the very presence of God. They had face-to-face -face communion with God. And in the language of the sanctuary, therefore, Eden, before the fall, becomes the most holy place. So the transition or the move that Adam and Eve made after the fall is that they left the most holy place, 
went out to the outer court of a fallen world or a fallen planet. John 3 verse 16 says, For God so loved the world, God in Jesus leaves the most holy place, comes down to the outer court of a lost world to seek for these people. And I hope you're following me. Adam and Eve leaves the presence of God because of sin, walk out through the holy place into the outer court of a fallen planet. Because of his love, God sends his son who also leaves the holy place, gets out of the holy place, most holy place, holy place, and to the outer court to seek for men. He left heavens to come and look for us. He left the, a righteous place, the best place in the whole universe to come and look for us. And we know that Jesus died on the cross to save you and I. And then he makes a statement in the book of Luke. In the book of Luke, Jesus makes a statement in chapter 9. Chapter 9 of Luke, verse 23. And if you're there, please let me know by saying amen. 9 of Luke, verse 23. I'm not there myself. Now I'm there. Amen. It says, And he said to them all, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Jesus leaves the most holy place. Sorry. The very presence of God and comes out to the earth, to the planet, to look for you. And then after completing his work, in the process of completing his work, he makes a call. Come, follow me. Come, follow me. So I want to... Find a way of making this physical, right here in front of you. Consider me, Jesus. Adam has already left the presence of God, is out in a fallen world. Because of the love of God, Jesus leaves the most holy place. Comes out to the fallen world on the outer court and dies on the altar of the cross. Has victory over death and gives us that victory by faith. But in so doing, he makes a call, come, follow me. It's like Jesus is leaving the fallen world, he's completed everything. And he's telling us, come, follow me. So we take a reverse journey with Jesus from a fallen earth back to the very presence of whom? Of God in the most holy place. Did you see that? I'll do that again, because it's very important for you to get that point. Every other thing will fall in place. Jesus leaves the most holy place, comes to a fallen world and completes his mission. And then with us, after completing his mission, he takes a reverse gear, for lack of better words. He takes us point by point from a fallen world back to the presence of the Lord in the holy place, most holy place. And it is in that basis, he says, come, follow me. Follow him from where? Follow him from a fallen, sinful world through all the processes back to the very presence of God in the most holy place, which is Eden restored. If that makes sense, please say amen. amen. Praise God. Did it really make sense? Amen. Glory to God. So Jesus is in the process of bringing us back from a fallen world to the very presence of God. His key word, come, follow me. And today we just want to do practical means because God has said without question, we ought to reflect his image. Irrespective of pastor who, doctor who, or teacher who is saying God has made it possible for you and me to reflect his character perfectly. And we are going to try and look at practical ways that God has given us or provided for us to ensure that we have been restored to the very presence of God, albeit by faith. Because in the end, when Christ comes a second time, we will be reunited. Amen? And so the first thing Jesus says, come, follow me to the altar of the cross. In other words, our point is not working, but if you look at the left side of the screen, this is the altar, and outside the altar is the camp of Israel. So Jesus goes all the way from the most holy place out to the camp and brings back the whole congregation to the sanctuary. 
He tells them, come, follow me. First step, follow me to the what? Altar. And so at the altar of sacrifice, self is to die. At the altar of the sacrifice, self is to die. In other words, Jesus is saying, you need to die to self on the altar of sacrifice. Because on this altar, Jesus died in darkness that we might live in light. On this altar, he was cut off that we might be reconciled back to God. Have you followed Jesus to the altar of sacrifice? On this same altar, Jesus was forsaken that we might be forgiven. On this particular altar, Jesus suffered rejection that we might be accepted. On that particular altar, he gave up his life that you might have your life. And he asked us to follow him onto that altar. And coming onto the altar of Christ, we ought to sacrifice self, to die to self. And with Paul, we are to say, I have been crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I by, Christ liveth in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Have you given your all on the altar? We are taking a journey back to Eden. We are on our journey back to the very presence of God. The first step back to the holy place is the altar of sacrifice. So you ask me, how am I going to reflect the image of Jesus? What is the first step? Come with Jesus to the altar of sacrifice and on that altar, let self be crucified. If that makes sense, please say amen. amen. So what has happened to George on the altar? Dead, thank you. He's dead. The old man is dead on the altar of sacrifice. He does not live. What do you do to dead people? You bury them. What's the, the best word for that? Like, it's a fin is it funeral service? Yeah. So dead people are supposed to be buried. It is on this basis that God now makes another call. Come, follow me. And he goes, George, thank you. Autumn leaves, thank you. You followed me to the altar and you've accepted to die to self. Now we are going for a funeral. You need to be buried. Follow me to the liver of baptism. Follow me to the liver of baptism. I don't want you to lose me. Jesus is bringing us from a fallen world back to the presence of the Lord. The first step is dying to self. And now that we are dead, we go for burial. The next step is the altar, the liver of baptism. But listen to what the prophet says. It is plainly written on the unrenewed heart and on a fallen world. All seek their own. Selfishness is the great law of our degenerate nature. Do you agree with that? Have you seen a young child less than one year crying because someone is sharing a food or a biscuit or something like that? Like you take something from a baby, a baby, and give it to another baby and they go like... Who, who taught them that? Which school did they learn that? Like less than one year, they already feel like, oh, how can you take something from me and give it to another person? And they turn ramps, roll on the ground, a child. Back home before we were saved, we kick you. But now we are saved, we go like, it's okay, it's going to be fine. Anyway, <laughs> selfishness is the nature of our degenerate lives. It says selfishness occupies that place in the soul where Christ should sit enthroned. Selfishness sits in our hearts naturally, on the seat where Jesus ought to be. Now, question, what needs to happen for Jesus to get back his seat? His selfish has to get off. Stand up, get off from Jesus' own throne. And that's what happens on the altar of sacrifice. And once we are dead, we can now follow Jesus to the next step and be buried with him. Come follow me to the burial. So we move with Jesus to the labor. We are following him back to the most holy place. We get baptized and you know what baptism means. In John chapter 3 verse 3 and 5, Jesus says something to Nicodemus. He says, unless you're born again, you cannot inherit the kingdom of God. 
And then he, he makes it clear in verse 5. Unless you're born of the water and the spirit, you cannot see the kingdom of God. Why? Let's go to Romans chapter 6 verse 3. Romans 6 verse 3. Romans 6 verse 3. We are following Jesus back to the most holy place. Romans 6 3, the Bible says, Know ye not that so many of us who are baptized into Jesus were baptized into his death? So what really does baptism mean? Let's continue reading verse 4. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in the newness of life. What happens at baptism, brothers and sisters? We are buried. Why are we buried at the liver? Because we already died where? On the altar. So by the time we get to a baptism, are we dead or alive? Dead. And it is a physical expression of a death that has already happened. When you choose in your heart to believe in God and say, I'm going to die to self, you're already dead. Then we go to your funeral service in, in, in Lake Rotorua. And you're buried with Christ to the newness of life. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Whoever is in Christ is a new what? Creature. The old is gone. Behold, everything has become new. Colossians 2, 12. Let's read Colossians 2, 12. Colossians chapter 2, verse 12. Buried with him in baptism... Wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God who hath raised him from the dead. So two things happen. Even though we are in our funeral service in, on the liver or at baptism, it is also accompanied with a resurrection to the newness of life. So self dies and a new man comes into being. You have just died on the altar. And now you are going out through a burial ceremony sister white says the new birth is a new experience in this age of the world and what does that mean people have had new meanings of what baptism is we have seen you are not baptized unless you're dead because baptism is a burial ceremony she says this is the reason why there are so many perplexities in the churches now, how many have attended a burial, any, any funeral service? Almost all of us. Almost all of us have lost someone. I think I'm right to conclude that. Now, consider this. You are going through a line seeing the dead person for the last time, and then maybe they said something, they cussed at you, or they beat your child, and you're still angry at them. And then you slap them. You slap them thoroughly. You are a bad person. What did you do to my child? Tell me, if that person rises up and said, what did you say? <laughs> what would you do as a human being? You will be frightened. In fact, most of us will run away to the best of their ability. Because what do we expect? Do we expect dead people to react? No, they don't. So you, plus, you slap a dead person and then he goes like, that was the left, slap the right one. You will run away. But Sister White says this. I think this is what is in our mind. She says, the reason why there are so many perplexities in their churches, many, so many, who assume the name of Christ are unsanctified and unholy. They have been baptized, but they were buried alive. Self did not die. And therefore, they did not rise to newness of life in Christ Jesus. Do you know why it is so hard to reflect the image of God? To an extent that even Adventist pastors are claiming we cannot reflect the image of Christ? Because during baptism, what happened? We were buried alive. We did not die on the altar. So we have a bunch of living dead, Seventh-day Adventists. You slap in on the left, the dead person goes like, you just touched my left cheek. And that is not cool. You take something from them, the, 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 you know, the dead person goes like, you just took my shirt. What, do you, what are you thinking? You talk to them about wrong doctrines in a nice way, they become mad, they want to bite you because they're alive. 
The expectation is that once we believe in Jesus Christ, we are dead. Self is gone. Jesus takes precedence. And baptism is a baptism of a dead person. But if we were baptized alive, unfortunately, even some of our church leaders worldwide were actually baptized alive. So nothing changed. But we are following the, you know, the paths of Jesus back to the very presence of God. He comes, follow me to the altar. On the altar, lay your everything. Self needs to die. And now that you are dead, crucified with me on the cross, follow me to the liver. On the liver, we will do your burial ceremony, which is burying the dead person and resurrecting the new man in Christ Jesus. And then it doesn't end there. He says, follow me to the holy place. We have come from outside looking at the blueprint of character building. We have followed Jesus to the altar, sacrificed self by the grace of God. We have gone through the burial process and baptism. The old man is dead, buried. The new man has lived. Now Jesus bids the new man to follow him into the holy place. And in the holy place you can see there are three articles. There is the table of showbread and there is the altar of incense. And then there is also at the seven lampstands. What is Jesus saying, bidding us to follow him into the holy place? One, he says, follow me to the shewbread, the table of shewbread. And what Christ is saying here is what Paul says in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. 1 Timothy 2, 15, if you could come with me. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. Second Timothy. Second Timothy, sorry. Second Timothy 2 verse 15. If you're there, please let me know by saying amen. We are following Jesus back to the very presence of God. In other words, we are looking at what character building really entails. How do we, are we brought back to reflect the image of God? It says here, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Eat of the bread of life. So when you become resurrected in newness of life, your life depends on the food, which is the spiritual food. It says in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, all scripture is given by the inspiration of whom? God. And is profitable for what? Doctrines, for reproof, for teaching, for instruction in righteousness. Study the word of God. It says in Psalm 119, verse 11, Thy word have I hidden in my heart that I may not sin against thee. Verse 105 of the same book. Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Study the word of God. So once that man dies on the liver and resurrects a new man, his life depends on food. And that food is the word of God. On the same note, Jesus says, you have followed me onto the table of showbread. You do Bible studies. You read your word with your family. You teach your children. You are fortifying your mind with the truth of the word of God. Now follow me to the altar of incense. And what does that really mean? Follow me to the altar of incense. Prayer. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 17, he says, pray with ceasing. Is that what he says? Pray without ceasing. Pray unceasingly. Philippians chapter 4 verse 6. Be careful for nothing but through prayer and supplication make your request known unto God and the peace of God that surpasses understanding shall be yours. Pray without ceasing. Sister White says, prayer is the breath of the soul. It is the secret of spiritual power. No other means of grace can be substituted and the health of the soul be preserved. Prayer brings the heart into immediate contact with the wellspring of life and strengthens the sinews and muscles of the religious experience. Neglect the prayer. Exercise of prayer or engage in prayer spasmodically now and then as seems convenient and you lose your hold on God. And so the young people brought up a song, which I want us to sing. Simple song. Read your Bible, pray every day, pray every day, 
pray every day. Read your Bible, pray every day, and you'll grow, grow, grow. And you'll grow, grow, grow. And you'll grow, grow, grow. Read your Bible, pray every day, and you grow, grow, grow. Then she continues. What does, the song, what does the song say? The song is actually um, a study of the sanctuary. Read your Bible, pray every day. We can actually put the words there. Go to the table of showbread and then the altar of incense. Read your Bible, pray every day, and you'll grow and grow and grow. And then they remind us, neglect your Bible and neglect prayer. And what happens? You shrink and shrink and shrink. Even young people are teaching us how character building is a simple process. Very simple. Spend time on the table of showbread, spend time on the altar of incense, and you will grow, grow, grow. The question is, grow to what? Answer me, grow to what? Grow to what? In character. Like day by day, if you continue doing this as a new man, then you will grow. And day by day, you will develop the character of Jesus in you, little by little, because we saw yesterday, it is a time-bound process, like plant seeding, uh, planting of seeds. And then Jesus does not stop there. He says, listen, follow me to the altar of incense, meaning pray every day. And then he takes it forward. Follow me to the seven lampstands. What do we have there? light. And he says in Matthew chapter 5 verse 14, you are the light of the world. Verse 16 it says, let your light do what? Shine. <coughs> Isaiah 43 verse 10, it says, you are my witnesses that I am God. It says the same thing in verse 12, Isaiah chapter 43, you are my witnesses that I am God. And so that we do this work of being the light of the world, Ephesians chapter 4 verse 11, he says, He has given unto some prophets. Let's read that verse. Ephesians chapter 4. So God has not only called us to be light, He has equipped us to be light. To be witnesses for Him. Which verse did I say? 4.11. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God and to a perfect man and to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. And you'll grow, grow, grow. He has equipped us to be light unto him. Let's do a recap. Jesus leaves the most holy place to seek for his men, his creation that is lost to the outer court of a fallen world. He fulfills his purpose of bringing back, of seeking and saving that which was lost. And then he bids them, follow me. He is taking us back to the very presence of God using the blueprint. Follow me to the altar. And on the altar lay your all. Self has to die on the altar. Follow me to the liver. On the waters of baptism, your burial ceremony is done. And you are dead and you resurrect as a new person. As a new being, follow me into the holy place. And in the holy place, make sure your life is governed by a Bible study lifestyle. Make sure your life is governed by a prayerful lifestyle. And make sure you are a witness for me. That once you do, it is so easy to build our character. God has made it so easy. As far as we cooperate with God on the dying of self, we cooperate with God throughout the baptismal process. We cooperate with him in those three articles of the Holy of Holies. We will grow and grow and grow to the full nature, full stature of Christ. This is not my word. It is the word of God. And I believe it. Listen, I believe it even when my weakness is playing before my eyes as a giant. I don't care. This is God's word. 
And not even my weakness will make me doubt the word of God. Most of us, even preachers, look at our weaknesses and say, because it is not possible with me, in my mind, I think this meant something different. No, it didn't. God is so serious, otherwise you don't have to... He wouldn't have sent his son to come and die if this is not what he means. Have you followed Jesus to the altar of the cross? Did you allow self to die? Did you follow him to the liver of baptism? Or were you buried alive? Are you causing trouble to the church of God, your local church, your local membership, because you are still alive when you ought to have died and be buried? Do you follow Jesus to the table of showbread? How is your life for Bible study? And I preach these things with me in mind. I fail all those steps. And that's why by the time we finish this week, we'll ask ourselves, where does our success lie, really? What do we do to fulfill this plan, the blueprint that God has given? Do you follow God to a life of Bible study, table of showbread? Do you follow God, Jesus, to the altar of incense and lead a prayerful life? It is like a breath to the soul. Have we followed Jesus to the altar, I mean to the table, seven lampstands, and be light unto him? And for this reason, Brother Clayton has been speaking to us here on the importance of going out and just being light. And the major question is, is, it just, is there just one way of being light for God? Like, must you go for the door to knock the door to be light for God? Must you preach like I'm doing? Otherwise, Ephesians chapter 4 verse 11 would make no sense because he's given people different talents. But find where you are good at and just be light for God. And as long as we engage in God's business, we will grow, I assure you. You know, Jesus does not stop there. <clears throat> Reflecting Christ 198. You are my witnesses, God says. By looking to me, meaning God, you are to become transformed in what? Character. By the manifestation of Christ-like forbearance and love, you are to reveal this transformation. Like to be witnesses for God is not just standing and preaching at the loudest of your voice. To be witnesses for God goes deeper than that. People need to see Jesus because the Bible says we are the light of the world. I've said this before, light is perceived by the sense of what? Sight. Life is, light is not touch, touched or heard. Light is seen. So in as much as God has given us speech as a gift, the major part of our witnessing, the major part of our terms of reference as witnesses for God has to do with what people see, not what people hear. That's why Jesus tells them, do not do what they do. Because that which they show, that which you see, speaks louder than words. And so you are God's witnesses, and we ought to engage in these three articles of the sanctuary to be on our path back to Eden. If that makes sense, please say amen. And my prayer is that God may give us strength and grace to put this into practice in our little, little ways. Because it doesn't take a big change. It takes small changes to bring that growth. And finally, he says, follow me to the most holy place. Because that's the very presence of God. And it's so easy to know what Jesus wants us to do when he calls us back to the most holy place. Because sin cannot survive the most holy place. Sin cannot survive the very presence of God. And for those who are forgotten, what really happens in the most holy place? The Bible says the high priest went into the most holy place how many times a year? Once a year. What was he going to do? The day of atonement, which actually meant cleansing of the sanctuary. Cleansing the sanctuary from what? Where did the sins come from? People. So in the daily process or the daily ceremony, sacrifice system, all the Israelites brought their sins and through the death of a lamb, the sins were transferred to the sanctuary. 
Because of that, the sanctuary was defiled. Once a year, on 10th of the seventh month, the high priest went into the most holy place and performed sacrifices that took all those records of sins from the sanctuary to a scapegoat. And so the sanctuary was cleansed by the death, by the blood, and all the records of the sins were transferred from the sanctuary to a scapegoat who represented whom? Satan. And then the scapegoat will be thrown away into the wilderness, a land inhabited. And in so doing, the whole camp of Israel would be declared holy. They were at one meant with God. God could interact with them. Reunion between man and God, face-to-face -face communion between man and God could be actualized. Because the only obstacle of sin has been dealt with or taken away. If that makes sense, please say amen. And so when Jesus says, follow me into the most holy place, what is he telling us? Cooperate with me in the work of cleansing the sanctuary. And how do you do that? Make sure that any sin is in your heart should be transferred to the sanctuary at the time when I am cleansing. Otherwise, the cleansing process finishes when you still have sins in your heart. So you ought to be transferring your sins to me in the most holy place. That is the cooperation I want from you. You ought to be transferring any sin that has crossed your mind to me in the sanctuary because we know not the time when I'm going to stop this cleansing process. And if I stop the cleansing, I finish the cleansing process, you still have sins in your heart. It means you are still defiled and you cannot be at one moment with God. You cannot appear in the very presence of God in the most holy place. When did that process begin? How many were born in 1844? Don't you think God is... How many years are those? Almost two centuries. God is still waiting for you to transfer those sins to him. Like he cannot finish the cleansing process unless you give him your sins. And then we have the devil telling us that's not possible. And because it is not possible, there is no point confessing. Jesus says it is possible. Satan says it is not. Sister White says in Maranatha 2.49, From the holy of holies, there goes on the grand work of instruction. The angels of God are communicating to men. Christ officiates in the sanctuary. She says, we do not follow him into the sanctuary as we should. Do you think this is accurate? And I just want to examine yourself. She says, we do not follow him into the sanctuary as we should. Sister White, understand the, the, the concept I'm giving you today. Jesus left the most holy place on the other side of the stage, came to a lost word on the outer court, did what he was supposed to do, and saved and sought for that which was lost. By his blood and done what the devil had done. And then he beats us, follow me. Follow me to the altar, let self die. Follow me to the labor of baptism, get buried and resurrected a new person. Follow me to the holy place and while there, study the word of God, lead a prayerful life and witness be a light for me. Follow me into the most holy place and make sure that your soul temple is cleansed of sin because when that process stops, there is no other probation. She says, there must be a purifying of the soul here upon the earth in harmony with Christ's cleansing of the sanctuary in heaven. And so the cleansing of the sanctuary process involves our hearts. Actually, it has to do with everything our hearts. My language could be limited, brothers and sisters, but I'm trying to say you should not wait a single second with a sin that hits your conviction. You need to confess. And through repentance and confession, send it to Jesus in the Holy of Holies. That is the only way we can follow Jesus into the most holy place. She says we don't follow her, him as we should. Now the problem is, in the sight of the prophet, second testimony is 337. Let's read this together. Just help George read, please, if you don't mind.
How, how do you feel for the prophet to refer to the church of God as sleeping people? How does that feel? It's cool, eh? It feels nice. Like looking at you this morning, going like a bunch of sleeping people. And then with all this strength I'm using and the shouting and the reading, sleeping preacher. So we are here saying, praise God, brothers and sisters, sleeping in front of the church. When the door of probation is closing, the work that Jesus is doing in the sanctuary, cleansing the sanctuary, is finishing, we have still held back on our sins and even planning to engage on more sins. Like we even have a plan, a diary to plan for sinning. The door of probation is closing soon, she says. Men and women are in the very last hours of probation and yet are careless and stupid. And the self in me, thank God is working on it, goes like, how can Ellen White call me stupid? Who is she? And then they go like, ah, she's not a prophet. She, was, she didn't even go to school. They start speaking like that. And I'm not talking about people outside the church. I'm talking about scholars in our church. Because Sister White makes this statement and many more that tell us we are not in a good place. People say, no, 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 I think she was not, she was not inspired. <coughs> they are careless and stupid. And ministers have no power to arouse them. They are asleep themselves. Sleeping preachers, preaching to sleeping people. I don't know when we will wake up. Everyone is snoring on his own corner. Probation is closing. Have we followed Jesus to the most holy place? Have you followed Jesus to the most holy place? Just read a bunch of quotations, then we can go. She says in 378, let the church commence the work of purification before God by what? Repentance and humiliation and deep heart searching, for we are in the antitypical day of atonement, solemn hour fraught with eternal results. Actually, we are late. We ought to have started so long ago. We are living in the great antitypical day of atonement. We must individually seek God. This is a corporate work. Is that what she says? This is a personal, personal work. She says, let everyone confess not his brother's sin, but his own sin. Let him humble his heart before God and become so filled with the Holy Spirit that his life will show that he has been born again. Take up your cross and follow me. What have we studied today? Jesus leaves the most holy place, comes to a lost world on the outer court, died on the altar in the outer court, gets victory over sin and death, and beats us, follow me. You ask me how our character is going to be developed to that of Christ? Listen, this is the blueprint. Follow Jesus to the altar of sacrifice, and right there, let self do what? Die. And with Paul, make an acclamation, I am crucified with Christ. It is not I that lives, but Christ liveth in me. And don't stop there. Follow Jesus to the liver of baptism. And because you were dead two days ago, or three days ago when you made that decision, decided to believe in God and surrender your life, you are actually a candidate for burial. And so you are buried in baptism, but also resurrected in the newness of life. And then the new life, with the new life, follow Jesus to the holy place. We are going back to God. While at the holy place, brothers and sisters, Make sure your life is governed by a Bible study. Fortify your minds with the word of the truth. Sister White says only those that fortify their mind with the truth of the word of God will stand the coming crisis. While there, lead a prayerful life. It is like life to the soul. You cannot be a Christian. In fact, she says somewhere that one minute without prayer is just death. Pray, let your breath be prayer. Let's not waste time talking about things that are not preparing us for heaven. Pray like never before. The Bible says pray unceasingly. But also, don't forget to be a witness for God. Be a light for God. Do good to the people. Speak to them about Christ. Share the gospel based on the talents that God has given unto you. But don't stop there, brothers and sisters. Follow him into the very presence of God. 
And we know that God does not condone sin because his eyes are flaming fire to sin. If you appear before God in the Holy of Holies with sin in your heart, you are doomed. And so how do we follow Jesus into the holy place, the most holy place? By transferring our sins through confession and humiliation of heart ahead of us. So that when the work of the cleansing of the sanctuary finishes, all our sins are with him. And has been taken from the sanctuary and put on the scapegoat who is the devil. And then our return to Eden is actualized. Easy, practical means of godliness. Made possible by God himself. Now listen, friends. I know time is up. Jesus is coming soon. And I, I just don't want to finish any form of sermon or preaching or Bible study without making a call. Because I feel myself ready to accept the call of repentance. And I'm not doing this because I'm better than you. I've said this severally. I even wonder, my wife and I sometimes wonder, why do, does God give us opportunities to preach? I mean, who are we? We are not theologians. We are just children of God like you and I. Anyone can stand here and I'm not better than you. But now I understand that I might have followed Jesus to the altar of incense. I mean, altar of sacrifice and actually died to self. Like literally died to self. I might have followed Jesus to the liver of baptism. And true to his word, I was buried and I resurrected in newness of life. I might have followed Jesus to the table of showbread and my life is governed by perfect, good Bible study. I might have followed Jesus to the altar of incense. Prayer is like the breath of my soul. I pray all the time. I pray unceasingly. I might have followed Jesus to the seven lampstands and I do my work as a witness to the best of my ability. Wherever I am, wherever I go but I still have a sin in my heart. I still plan to sin in my heart. I still think of evil on the part of other people. I still condone evil. I still sit and listen to people backbite others. I still sit and listen to gossip, meaning I have not followed Jesus into the most holy place. And just that final step may close the door of heaven for me. And today I'm making a call for repentance. I want us to repent before God of known and unknown sins. If you're in the same position as me, I'm going to call you to come forward. This is not an easy call because it is like confessing before people that I still have sin in me, even though I come to autumn leaves. I want to pray with you because I'm in the same state. I pray that God gives me grace to have victory over sin that is entangling me. I want to place my soul in a status where Jesus can dwell in it. I want to take advantage of all the providences of the Lord and go through the blueprint in preparation for his second coming. Just come. Come forward. The stage belongs to you. Thank you, brother. Don't worry about the seats. The angels have taken the spaces because we really need them. And I want to pray that God may touch our hearts, that our sin may not discourage us to get to despair and run away from God because that's the reason he came to die. Those same sins that are causing you to feel like I'm not fit are the same sins for which he came to die. And so it's so ironic that the devil can push you to a point to go like, I'm so sinful to come to Jesus. In fact, you are so sinful to come to Jesus. That's why you need to come. Because he did not come to save righteous people. I want to thank God for his work in our hearts. And I'm just going to ask that those who are able to kneel down as we pray. And feel free to whisper a prayer for yourself, your children for the confession of sin. And if possible, if you're close to anyone, just hold your hands together. Let us pray. 
our heavenly and everlasting Father. Lord, we are once again before the throne of grace this morning, Lord, confessing our sins. We will not use many words, heavenly Lord. Search our hearts. And if there be anything, anything, Lord God, anything that stands in the way between me and you, Father, take it away by your grace. <coughs> Cleanse us, forgive us, and give us the strength to cooperate with you. I know most of us, Lord God, have followed you to the altar of sacrifice. Most of you, us, Lord, have followed you to the level of baptism. Most of us, Heavenly Father, have followed you in the newness of life to the holy place and have done the best in our ability to lead a life of Bible study, prayerful life, and have done that which we are able to do to be witnesses for you. But Lord, maybe most of us have not followed you to the holy place, most holy place, because we still harbor and plan for evil. It is for this reason that we are before you today. Lord, forgive us, cleanse us, make us anew, Lord God, that our hearts may be conducive for your endearing presence. We long for you, dear Father. We long to be your people. We long to live for you in this end time. And we know we will not do that with an iota of sin. We long to be sealed, even Lord, when the sealing process finishes. We ask that you may guide us dear Lord. If there is anyone in this congregation who has not followed you to the altar, has not given his life for you, have not believed the gospel story, if there's anyone here, oh God, who has believed the gospel story but have not followed you to the Lord, liver of baptism, Lord God, we ask that you may bring them to us, Lord of mercy, that you may talk and share with them and encourage them, Lord God, to make a decision for you and express it through a baptism. We glorify your name for all you've done unto us. We thank you for this meeting. We thank you for autumn leaves. We thank you for the Seventh-day Adventist Church worldwide. Mm -hmm. Lord, we know we are not ready, and this is the reason why we come to you now, mm -hmm. that you may help us, make us ready to finish the work. For we ask us believing and trusting in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Amen.